Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Fabled 42, where we create community through friendship, gaming, and chaos. I am today's moderator and honestly, the most casual person ever, Jordan, better known as Casual. You can find me on all socials at casual underscore Campbell. Um, leading off, I wanted to do a congratulations to the Frisky Clicker. You have won the giveaway. Please head over to the Fable 42 Discord message, Chris Solo, to claim your prize. But stay here for more of the color of change. Um, we're going to go through a few of our announcements on sponsors and what this is all about. And then we'll introduce the wonderful people that are here with us today. So there are a few moments more stressful than watching dice roll as you're attacking that dragon on its horde and watching that dice roll and get that natural 20, that celebratory moment. And those dice can be brought to you by Critical Dice. Right now, they have a great collection of dice where I actually just got a bundle package of four packs of dice from them, each more amazing than the last. And they also provided me the most beautiful dice bag right here, full of mm. dice. So you can head over to Critical Dice and use the code FABLED42 to get 20% off all non-subscription items. And when it comes to playing at these tables, we have so much to keep track of with paper and everything that's two-dimensional right down. But if you want to make it pop into that third dimension, look no further than Griffin Co. From miniatures and terrain, they have the power of 3D printing and the desire to turn a hobby, turn passion to bring that extra flavor to expand the table. And you can also support us, much like these partners and sponsors have, by checking out. You can do Twitch, Twitch Bits subscriptions. You can also go over to our Patreon, subscribe to everything we do there, including an upcoming Wizards Prom watch party that's taking place this Sunday. And if you aren't a Patreon sub and you're not keen on subscriptions, you can head over to Ko-Fi and you can also buy a ticket to prom and also just donate to help keep Fable 42 doing what we do best. You can also check out our YouTube and podcasts such as uh, I believe we're on iTunes and then Spotify. But the reason we're here is to thank, first off, we're working with a charity, Color of Change. Black history is more than a month of acknowledgement. It is centuries of creativity as much as our adversity. Striving to bring awareness of that starts with the first steps of educating and advocating for changes in the society that have impacted the lives of people of color. This month, we aim to provide that support that will last for years to come. Color of Change designs campaigns powerful enough to end practices that unfairly hold Black people back and champion solutions that move us all forward until justice is real. You can head over to the website Tiltify and you can also see in the panel below, you can click on that to donate to everything to what we've aimed here. We already had at least one D&D game we had last Friday that I DM, which we were able to raise $785. That donation, you can keep donating to that, that cause, and it, I promise you it will lead into a great closing game where GW will also be a DM next Friday in his amazing game. And if you haven't seen it, I'm saying you should probably go check out the Threat of Kamali one, which was a tribute to Black Panther and Chadwick Boseman. It was beautiful and amazing. But I know you're not here to hear me talk forever, so I want to do introduce the beautiful, wonderful panels we have today. GW, you want to take it off? Yes. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm GW. You can find me here on the Fable 42 uh, on uh, various events like this one. Uh, you can also find me on uh, IG and Twitter under GW005. That's two Bs and two zeros. Uh, you can also, also, also find me on uh, Clarion and Dom, which is a sci-fi audio podcast. Um, it is, uh, I'll be playing a uh, very interesting uh, um poet engineer which has a really interesting story that he leads so you can find me there either at um clarion.com or any of your favorite uh podcast platforms and, you, and as jordan already said you can find me here next friday dming my uh gang for black history month with a whole bunch of players uh, sit over here included uh, i can't wait to uh, introduce you to everyone else beautiful thank you so much gw sydney up next Right, that would make sense. Okay, hi, I'm Sydney Adams. Nice to meet all of you. Um, I have been in GW's games a couple times and I am a game designer at Wizards of the Coast. Um, my recent uh, product, Black is Magic, just came out. Um, I was the creative lead with it. A bunch of people on the team worked really hard on it. So if you're interested, definitely check that out. It is a labor of love. Um, and uh, right now I'm working on Dungeons and Dragons. I love it so much. Thank you. And also, you know, everyone check out that Black Magic. I mean, 
don't know if you've met me, but um, I wholeheartedly agree. Black magic. It's just, a tr- it's just a truth. <laughs> Hi there. My name is Christoph Fisher. Um, I'm the owner of Cantrip Candles, which is a candle company that creates uh, immersive scents for use with tabletop adventure games. Um, we recently just opened a store in Hollywood, so I'm very tired and very happy. Um, you can find out more about Cantrip Candles at www.cantripcandles.com or at Cantrip Candles. Beautiful. Take, I mean, guys. I remember when I was introduced to Cantrip Candles, went to the website, and I just, my nerd heart was just beating fervently to have those aromas fill my house. So check it out, Cantrip Candles. I mean, I'm a warlock at heart, so you know I'm, I'm all about Cantrip Candles. Candles anyway. are good. You got you to gotta <laughs> have them. You got to have them. <laughs> all right. And so moving along, last but certainly not least, Jade. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Jade Valkyrie. I am a content creator and cosplayer who is a self-proclaimed huge RPG nerd, hoping to get into some D&D sessions online soon. But until then, please check out my Twitch, um, which is Jade Valkyrie with a three at the end, not me. Blame Twitch about that. But everywhere else, I'm Jade Valkyrie with an E. All right, let's check that out. I mean, as you've heard, we have a great panel of creators who have done a lot of things in the community of the Black community, the nerd culture, and today we're talking about how that bridge has been connected in many ways. I feel like the best way to start it off is pretty much a simple question. We're, our, we're Black creators in gaming, that's either tabletop RPG, virtual, digital. Just to get an idea of who you are, what is your favorite game, be it digital or tabletop, and give a little reason as to why? That way everyone gets to know who you are. And I, to help ease that pressure for me, as a general strokes, I'm a huge fan of fantasy nerd. JRPGs mm-hmm. have always been things for me because I loved like anime growing up, Dragon Ball, uh, Naruto, even older Yu Yu Hakusho and Ayasha. But I was introduced to Final Fantasy VIII with that very edgy protagonist and just the artistic feel of it really drew me the long way through, all the way through Kingdom Hearts. So much so that I admittedly do have a tattoo from Kingdom Hearts too because of how much it meant to me. So like, that's kind of like my favorite game. And it's, it's meant a lot just because the storytelling in it and the artistic beauty of it. And the fact that Final Fantasy has always been very open about like global issues in their worlds and they don't try to hide it or soften it. They'll let you know mm-hmm. that the world sucks, but you can make it better by being better. So that's that's for me. Anyway, uh, GW, or right, Christoph, yeah, it looks like you got something. Uh, it, I mean, it's appropriate because of the name of this channel, but I would probably say Fable on Xbox was maybe one of my favorite games. It's It kind of was the first game to make me feel like I actually was in control of the story, which now my new favorite game is D&D because you're always in control of the story. I mean, you can't be wrong with D&D. You can't. <laughs> What else? Um, I, I, I share the sentiment with Final Fantasy and there was another game that I loved. I think it was called Sun Soul, I believe. Uh, but most games to where you can build your own team and like level them up as you go and like adventure, I love games like that. So D&D, Final Fantasy, uh, Sun Soul. Um, there's a couple of other ones that I can't think of, but just any game that you can like kind of live the story. I think D&D kind of takes it just because you can make the exact character you want. You can really sculpt what you want rather than like a video game where you're just kind of, you know, taking little elements that you can kind of put together to make something close to what you want. Mm-hmm. But yeah, those are those are mine. I like it. I really like it. I mean, that's what makes D&D powerful. Sydney, Jade, either of you two? Oh, I definitely Jade. got one. So my favorite is definitely, without a doubt, Dragon Age Origins. It's like one of my favorite games. Played so many times. I'm still playing it now. This game has come out in like 2009. I'm still obsessed, Um, which is almost what I would say is one of like the better games that's like RPG-esque. And I mean, Bioware is inspired by D&D. I think they made like the original Baldur's Gate, which was like D&D 3.5, if I think. But anyways, very close to D&D, one of my favorites, um, really heart-wrenching, and it just took, took me, like, right around, like, that middle school time, so really for that hyperfixation, and it just hasn't, it hasn't left yet. I still love the franchise. I, I nice. love it. Actually, Dragon Age Origins is one of my first fantasy RPGs that I think I've ever played, and I still, to this day, play that. 
and occasionally inquisition. I don't have to about Dragon Age 2 very much. We, we're just going to call that a blip. <laughs> yeah, my girl Isabella is in too, and she gets more screen time in too. So therefore, I like, I give it like that leeway because I was love Isabella to death. Yeah. But and I, I feel you know what? You. Fair enough, because um, Fenris, hands oh, down, him too. He's the he's the husband though. He's yeah. number one video game husband for me. Husband. <laughs> oh wow! Number one. Wow. <laughs> You might have to fight for that one. I mean, Ooh. I don't really play Final Fantasy, so most of those those boys aren't really, they're not really in that realm for me. But I'm sure if I did, there'd be more competition. <laughs> oh, touche, touche. And uh, Sydney. Yeah. Um, I know we've all played tons and tons of games. And being that I do what I do, you would expect me to be like, ah, hands down, Dungeons mm. and Dragons. Um, no, it's not actually. <laughs> I do love love me some Dungeons and Dragons but the first game that was like okay this game is actually gonna change the way I think about games um this might be cheating but it's a tie uh between Majora's Mask Zelda Majora's Mask and Undertale and this is why right like agency in games is such a big thing to me right and and Majora's Mask was the first game that actually delivered agency to me because if you did not figure out how to get past that point with that stupid moon Mm -hmm. the world would end Mm -hmm. and there were no there's no assistance there was no like hand holding it was like look figure it out or play the ocarina and stop it and then live that life again Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then Undertale basically took that idea of agency and then like blew it up into an entire game about you know good and evil and right and wrong and you know how many times in life have you had to fight or have you fought before you've actually even considered a fighting was the thing that you should be doing and after I finished that game and I I ended up with a neutral path I didn't even end up with like the worst path possible but at the end I was like am I a good person and that's why those are my (laughs) favorite games (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh that's that's great that's that's honestly amazing um and by the way everyone watching if there's certain questions that you do have for the panelists or the general panel please don't be afraid to type it in there i will get to it as necessary you can go ahead and either at favor 42 because he is running the tech or you can go ahead and just at me directly it'll pop up and i'll see it i'll notate it and see when we can plug that in but i do want to move on to like we know where you what got you or one of your favorite things so each of you have become a content creator a, um, or an asset creator, such as the Candles, and you have involved yourself in what is considered nerd culture. So it's kind of a two-part question, which is, what does nerd culture mean for you? And what drew you into this nerd culture? And I'll give you a moment to kind of like mull that over. Nerd culture means a lot to a lot of people, and some people have seen the negative um, connotation of the phrasing, such as nerd, geek, and so on. And certain people have taken that to become their identity. So, when it comes to that, what does it mean for you? And like, what really brought you into enjoying it? For me, nerd was a category or a title that was kind of put on to me. I never associated myself as a nerd or a geek, especially growing up. But the things that I was interested in were part of nerd and geek culture, X-Men, Magic the Gathering cards. Like I, again, on the surface, yeah, those are all nerdy geek things, but I remember it wasn't cool to be a nerd. It wasn't cool to be a geek. Now I make a living off of being a nerd and a geek and I've completely transformed how I relate to that community. Personally speaking, I love how welcoming the nerdy and geeky community can be and the culture of it it's an incredibly supportive community because I feel like it's comprised of a lot of people that might've been bullied at a younger age because of what they enjoyed and things like that. So I'm all about the nerd culture. I love it. I appreciate that. Uh, Sydney. Yeah. That, that really helped jog some stuff. Thank you, Christoph. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say for me, nerd culture is a combination of marginalized groups finding community around the things that they enjoy you know um I think you know speaking about that time when it wasn't cool you know like it you were an outcast for it you know and sometimes you had already been an outcast depending on you know what you look like what you wore that kind of thing but 
you could immediately relate to another person by just saying like, yo, you watch Toonami, you know, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden, yes. there's this, all of a sudden there's this trust that could never have been built had you not just had that immediate connection. You know, like when I think it's that feeling that you have when you go to a con and you're like, I'm home. I came. I'm home. Where are the mm-hmm. comics? Let's get it on. You know, and uh, now that it's mainstream, I think it's a great thing because now uh, the people who loved it are now being able to support themselves with the thing that they love. And that is a really positive thing to it. Um And I think sometimes the negative part is trying to figure out, you know, the validity of your nerdness, you know, like if nerddom is something that can be earned, is it something that can be lost? Is it, if it can be earned, does that mean that you have to do certain things? And I feel like, especially as like women, you know, uh, we, you know, me and Jade may have to sometimes qualify. We may have to sometimes um, prove that we're like nerd enough to be in certain spaces when we've been here all along. So mm-hmm. it, it, there's there's a lot of fraughtness, but I think at the end it's all love, you know. I do I do appreciate that. Uh, I did see Jade also kind of do a ready yeah. speak. I'm going to use the secret sign language and be like, I want to go next. Like, please, please, please. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, I definitely agree with what Sydney said. Um, I, for me, being a nerd is hereditary. Like, that's just what I grew up on. I have young parents. Um, my dad thought the best way to babysit me while my mom was like studying through law school was to be like, okay, we're going to watch um, X-Men 80s cartoons. Uh, you want to read a book? Here's a comic book. Um, you want to sit on my lap while I play some video games like that was that's just how I grew up so it's just been hereditary for me it wasn't until I got older and I got outside of like you know my sphere my family really that I was told that like being a nerd wasn't cool and I had Mm -hmm. to as Sydney said prove that I was a nerd me holding my like Marvel like encyclopedia from A to Z I had like their power stats of like all the Marvel characters I like held that book for dear life and like memorized all of it just because like I liked reading but um I never forget there was one time in middle school where someone was like oh yeah when so and so is not stronger than She-Hulk and I'm like actually She-Hulk can bench this amount of tons and he can only bench about this amount of tons so um you're wrong I like had my like little not little as a huge huge encyclopedia so um kind of like those moments of being like uh, like proving yourself to be a nerd but really it's just like it just so happens that I was because of what I like. And now I'm here. Might as well stay here because I love it. And it's comfy. <laughs> I mean, it might as well stay. It is comfy and we appreciate every contribution you have made. Well, that leaves GW. I'm assuming you have something now. You wanna... I do. Before I say anything, though, I think I saw Christoph, uh, like wave a... It's a, I just wanted to make a small statement about I, I really understand and I can't relate to it in the same way, but the, ha- the idea of having to prove your your membership card in a, in a nerd or geek community. I wonder, though, if some of that is because our community is heavily based on facts about things that don't exist. So the entire way that you show your obviously it's abused and put way too much on women. And we see that time and time again. But in order to kind of prove your worth you do have to argue and and you as much as it can be annoying how many times do you get into discussions with other nerds or geeks and it's technically an argument but you're still having fun because it's about stats and stuff like that so it can yeah, be a discourse is and, part of it for sure. yeah but it can get really dark really quick i think yeah i can, and we could definitely we've seen that many times that's what created gatekeeping where they were like i need your i need proof of your nerd card please mm-hmm. swipe your nerd mm-hmm. card mm-hmm. you exit yeah. know how much superman could bench if he was fighting against the hulk in a battle with like tom and you're you're like wait <laughs> what jay knows jay's got Sometimes the, jay's I just got wake the encyclopedia up. hold on page <laughs> wake up That's in the middle of the night at like 3 a.m <laughs> and i just think of that one time that my friend asked me it's like oh you don't like robin like i love robin and i'm like yes i do <laughs> what's the color of his eyes behind his mask and i was like i know the answer and then i answered it and she just looked at me like i just wake up from <laughs> and think of that moment it's delightful it's a gw love it what does their culture mean to you and what got you in it 
everyone kind of said it perfectly. It was the community. I, I kind of had the opposite uh, experience that Jay got. Um, my family wasn't really, you know, kind of nerd centric. It was very, I mean, they were creative. Like, you know, my mom sews, my dad does like metal work and stuff like that. But they were never like, you know, uh, into comic books. They weren't into superheroes or anything. They, they were, they were the cool kids, or whatever, you know, whatever. Um, and then when I got into it, I think <laughs> um, it was, it was first anime that kind of brought me in and I kind of like the crazy stories on that. And then it was the games and, and all of the above. And then once I found people that liked, liked it as well, it, it felt like we kind of made our own bond. It felt like a community, it felt like a family that I, I, di I didn't know was really out there because I didn't really have anyone in my family to be like, you know, like, oh yeah, we have, you know, there's this and this and you, you like to draw and do this. And so maybe, you know, watch these shows or anything. So I kind of had to figure that out on my own and with my friends. So it was, it was definitely kind of like a, a us bonding in a, in, a, in, a, in a certain way. And what got me to stay is that everything is just so much fun. Mm -hmm. Like, like I said, like, I love adventure. I love magic. I love uh, things exploding. I, I love all the above and with, with gaming and just in, in geekiness in general, it's like kind of like the sky is the limit. There is no kind of a bounds that you would normally see in like, you know, everyday television or, or, you know, or, or like a regular book or something like that. It, it can be very extreme. And another thing that what, what got me to stay is that I didn't see too much of me in like what I was watching and in my friend groups, I didn't see too much of me. And so that kind of got my own mind moving to, you know, like, why don't, yeah, why don't I see, you know, a person that looks like me or, or, or anything like that. And of, and of course, it, it has like different reasonings from anime to to regular like you know uh cartoon television static shock was my jam mm -hmm. that's, another, that's, that's, that's another story that's another story but um yeah so it, it was kind of like in a very very nice way I, I kind of don't even really want to say it but like you know how some groups kind of have like a like a token friend or whatever to kind of I don't want to say you know mm -hmm. balance the team or anything like that but it, it was somewhat like that it, it was a, a blend of me wanting to show more things that kind of I create. And it was a blend of my friends like welcoming me like, God, we, we've been waiting for you. Like, oh, please help us like see a different way or whatever, anything like that. So that's what kind of got me into it and what got me to stay. Mm. That's beautifully put. And I think that sentiment of like wanting to see yourself be represented was one of the biggest things that was hard in nerd culture, especially when you think about fantasy games are always built in the medieval times. And it's almost like as if black people did not exist when medieval times were going on. Like the concept of a, anyone of color in these times where knights existed is just utterly so fantastical. But dragons, we can have dragons. I don't know about people of color, but dragons, trolls, goblins, I got you. And that kind of leads over to like one of the biggest challenges. This is the question. What is one of, if not the biggest challenge that you feel people of color in general have to face when it comes to nerd culture? Something that either you face or you feel that others have to deal with when it comes to being considered a minority in a minority group itself. Um, one of the challenges that, that I had with, uh, cause I, I, I've been through a, a number of kind of like short lived D and D groups before I found my final one to where I could really like elaborate on my character, but some challenges that I had were, you know, some people, some, you know, yeah, just some people, cause the players were kind of like similar in a way like, oh, well, if you want to be like that race, you can't. You can't be like, you know, black, like, you know, this race is, looks like this, that race looks like that, whatever. And I'm just like, mm, but this is a fantasy world. Like we, we can do whatever we want. So my character uh, from, from uh, the first campaign uh, of Realms, before he was in Realms, there was a couple of changes made before that, just because of kind of other kind of like, closed-minded DMs only looking a certain way. So that was one th of the challenges that I that I faced uh, with creating a, a melanin character 
uh, in the world that was not evil, that was not from an evil background, <laughs> whose you know family did have money, like it wasn't like a huge tragedy, <laughs> but that was uh, one of the things that I kind of faced in, in, the, in the past that I had to learn how to get over that hurdle and to just be like, you know what? No, you're about to listen. This mm-hmm. is not how this is about yep. to go. <laughs> and that's an important thing to know that like your voice should be heard, mm-hmm. not thrown to the side because this is the way that things are. Cause that's how we end up in the issues we're in. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyone else want to put forth? Sid? Yeah. Um... I think, you know, you really sort of nailed like some of it, like for me, I guess if I could put it succinctly, it's feel, it's, it's the feeling of being an afterthought. Like that is the one thing that I feel like no matter what aspect of the culture I've had to, like I've got to enjoy, there's, there's still those moments that sort of like sucks, you know, like thinking about like how long it takes a game that you do enjoy, right, and you love to come up with a character that looks like you, Mm -hmm. you know, how many times do you have to just do it yourself? How many times do you have to be the one bringing the diversity into the environment? And how many times is the environment, you know, uh, made from the jump, you know, with diversity? Like there are so many games that I know that like start off with like the, you know, very basic, very media, you know, friendly version of the team. And then like in like the second edition or like the DLC, then you see people of color, Mm -hmm. you know, and that bothers me like as a designer a lot because it's not like we're asking for different things. We've been asking for representation and diversity and for our games, even in fantasy to reflect their audiences for a very long time. So the fact that there are people who still struggle with it when we can see time and time again, and we can show time and time again, the things that work, you know, it it feels like a lack of care at that point. And that's Mm -hmm. why it feels like you're an afterthought because it's like, if you did care, then this would already be here, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, Like similar to Jade, my mother was the one who got me into games. Like there's pictures of uh, me sitting on her lap while she plays with the NES, you know, original Zelda. Um, And that sort of realization, that, that sudden realization, I think sometimes when you get from solo games to MMORPGs or just any interaction where you're with the group is when you realize your otherness. Mm -hmm. And I guess for me, the things that are difficult are things that continue to spark that otherness in me, instead of feeling like I'm part of the collective and feeling that lovely feeling of, yes, we all nerd out about static shock, like you suddenly feel that jolt of like, oh, right, there is a difference, you know, Mm -hmm. and and that I, 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 it's, it's hard. (laughs) It is, It, it truly is, because we do, we, not just people of color, but in general, like, most people that are not considered the typical majority market have always been an afterthought in so many productions, publications, creations. There's always the fact that it's always written as if, oh, by the way, there are people of color. It used to be the same way. It was, oh, there's women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, people can be different than me. And it's always, oh, by the way, let me include that. So I can see that on a thing. Um, and I've, and I've so to quickly sort of like jump in on that too. Like, I feel like now in games, we have this weird trope situation now where if That's a game does start out, out, yeah, I, I can let you get into it. But like the one thing that pisses me off is like, okay, I do love a badass black woman. Not every single woman who is black has a machine gun in a smoky voice and is coming for you With you know outro. like <laughs> yeah like i feel like it's gone to the point now where like it becomes the diversity of like all right we need that diversity here you go thing we think we understand <laughs> honestly and if i i do want to just on that point there's something that's always bothered me personally is that whenever it came to black people being able to do magic it's almost always voodoo oh Oh my gosh, I didn't like, even make that connection. That's so true. That every time it's always, um, they're always in Louisiana, New Orleans, some kind of a voodoo magic down on the bayou. But the idea of having- There's bones. The, yeah, there's bones, the there's oracle, the but you never have like, but the idea of like a normal person of color that can just be a wizard, be a warlock. They have to do voodoo magic for some mm-hmm. reason. 
and that's like in the world of fantasy on that but and that's something i just always thought about like one of the tropes is when you're talking about tropes there's always these specific tropes where there's the old wise black magic guy there's always the voodoo female that can do this and when a black woman shows up she's got to hold a gun bigger than her and be rough and tough because they can't be softer and strong at the same time Mm -hmm. in the same way that black men have to be the certain type of intimidating factor or we're that mm, dainty nerd that can't do anything mm-hmm. for our own like we get super typecasted on one side of the extreme where we're super intimidating everyone or it's the other side where we're so passive that we're not a threat to anybody i guess a, it can also yeah. be kind of summed up as uh, black characters are not able to have they are not given the room to have multi, a multifaceted personality uh, they can only fill a role. Meanwhile, all, a lot of other characters, be them purple or white or whatever, they will have full on arcs of change and there will be character change. And often the, the black characters will maintain that like, choo choo, everyone on the train, like that kind of nonsense. And you're like, I mean, sure. I'm glad there's black people in this game, but there's more to us as a people. Yeah, exactly. And you don't want it to feel either like, oh, we put black people in the game and we're like, we don't like that, that depiction. And it's like, why are you mad? They're in the game. Right. You know, and so it's like, I thought you wanted them. We mm-hmm. did. <laughs> it's like, not like this. Represented not to be posterized for an appeasement. Mm-hmm. And I want to highlight that that happens just in general to minorities across the board. Everything gets typecasted really hard. And then you don't get the chance to speak up on it because we should just be happy that we're being included. Yeah. Like one thing I've been trying to really push, you know, uh, in my own design practice with the people that I can talk to around me is, you know, trying to make that clear distinction. Like this is not about black faces. This is about black stories, mm-hmm. you know, this cause a black face, right. Exists like all other faces. It exists for as long as you look at it. And if you look away, it's gone. If you if you put that much effort that all you can do is once you look at it, that's when it exists. That's what it is. And it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't inspire anything. But if you have a story behind that person, if that's a Black story, it's not just a story you graft onto them based on your assumptions or your stereotypes. That's when you can have love. That's when you can have belief in it. You know, like and Regina King's character, character. Yeah, on mm-hmm. Watchmen. Yeah. Like, black stories oh yes and that's and it's important to think about when it comes to the worlds that are built which um leads into a question that has been submitted and i i think it's a, a great question before so, before we do i think i saw uh jay's fingers go up that um you want to add anything to this oh i was just gonna say that like that's really important and that's why i really admire creators and designers like within the sphere like sydney um like really working to make those black stories happen because it's really obviously clear when they try to do and it comes to that black face thing because there's there's nobody in the writer's room telling them that that there's a difference so they don't know the difference because there's no one there to tell them like hey or no Mm -hmm. one there to write it themselves so Mm -hmm. um having having black creators in the room having black writers and black designers in the like synthesis in the beginning of the process wouldn't lead to these problems that we had later down the path And honestly, I can agree more. One of the biggest things is we, if we don't have a voice in the room, we can't be heard. Exactly. So we have a lot of things that come out with these arbitrary concepts and we don't get represented because there was no one telling that person, hey, no, that's not how this works. Yeah, yeah, and you can't say, don't do it. <laughs> like sometimes yeah. you just need the one person. Just you one need- person to be like, um, no, that's mm-hmm. not how this works at all. You know, we have <laughs> all seen something. We're like, ooh. There was nobody there. Yeah, yeah. I know nobody yes, was we, there because we would have said something. Yeah, <laughs> all, all, thank you all the time. All and be, it comes down to like when building worlds, like so. That's brought a uh, question actually about queer venture time, Austin. Thank you. Uh, when so much of these fantasy worlds are anchored in like token fantasy archetypes, and given how there's been this concept of where tokens, um, lack of a better term his choice of preference lies. How heavily do you think the intentions of the author bleeds into gameplay 
and how do you suggest we avoid or change it? Hold on, from the person, <laughs> the, can you give me the second part of that question again? Um, how heavily do you think the intentions of the author, author bleeds into the gameplay of these things that are being created and how do you suggest we avoid or try to change this? Are they talking about Tolkien's influence or people who are ripping off Tolkien? That's the question. People that mostly are ripping off Tolkien. Kind of obviously can't Tolkien. Yeah. We can't t- make Tolkien rewrite it. <laughs> because um, first off, I was one of really, I'm just, I really want, I love just, like I said, I love Dragon Age, just one of my favorite thing. But we need to just, chill out with like ripping off Tolkien at this point. <laughs> like we really, we really, really need to like, cut, like infant, there's been decades. We can come up with something else. I'm sure of it. So that's, that, that's point one. Point two is that there is only a certain amount of like intention that an author can put well in like a well-intended author can put and on something that is founded upon anti-black values to make it into something that's not anti-black it's really really difficult and those foundations will still be there and like those remnants will still be there in that foundation um not saying that no one can play anything that's Tolkien related but it's 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 just a sad fact of the matter that it it those tones will still be there um, it's just a matter of like how we interact with it. Yeah, I think, you know, like talking about like Lord of the Rings and, you know, because I, I I have personally just spent a lot of time thinking about Tolkien and his influence and figuring out things regarding that um, and how to sort of distance it. I think if if you're thinking about mainstream culture, Divorcing Tolkien's influence is fully now de- uh, dependent on the individual creator, because I think we've seen we've got too many trilogies, we've got too many different series, we've got too much of the pervasive argument being that you know elves are thin and tall and light skinned and long flowing blonde hair and they shoot arrows good and that is what an elf is. You know, we have too much of, you know, this is what an orc, this is what a dwarf is. So I feel like the only way we can avoid it is to be intentional about changing it. Mm -hmm. Um, And in terms of like how you change it, I think that uh, one thing I try to do, like when I'm trying to stay off a trope, when I design is I will just go completely in the opposite direction and see how that feels and then just sort of chip back at it and chip back down to being like, okay, what is it about, let's say elves? What is it about elves that needs to be preserved? You know, what is the thing about being an elf that's cool? And for me, I'd be like, you know what? The ears, the ears can stay and nothing else, (laughs) right? (laughs) So For me, the ears. (laughs) Yeah, so I keep the ears and I'm like, okay, we're gonna keep the ears and we're gonna do the complete opposite. And we're gonna, and I'm just gonna throw some crazy stuff out there. I'll be like, ah, space. All right, what else? They live underground. Uh, how about, no, they live in the sky. You know, and you just basically throw things. It, it, it has to be intentional is really what I'm trying to say. Mm. You, can't, you, can, you can't stumble into change. You know, mm. like if, if you're being very, like it, we, we will inherit a, a history of fantasy because so much of it exists, um, but we can completely change if we either a look at it from a completely different vantage or start looking at different cultures you know i think we forget that so many globally not even just america you know there are there are mythos in every single type mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. of culture and we forget that so i think you know also looking at different countries and what they consider to be terrifying what they consider to be interesting or beautiful and drawing <clears throat> influence from that instead of the same you know european influences we've had throughout mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. The intention is important. You can't just, one thing you can't do, I want to add on that is you can't just color a race and say, hey, now they're this, mm-hmm. just to appease that. I've, I've been at a table where someone, well, if you want to be a black elf, just you can be a drow. I'm like, I didn't want to be a drow. I want to be an elf yeah. with dark skin. Mm-hmm. Well, 
well, oh, we, they are not normally like that. I'm like, says who? And that's yeah. the intention of it. Like, you have to intentionally realize that you can't just say, hey, you want to be darker, be darker. It's like, I want to be dark because that is what I, we are, not, oh, I'm happy to be a colored individual in a non colored group. Because the intention is clear. I'm an afterthought. Yeah, that's the feeling. And that's what you don't want. And then I know, Christoph, you, um, you had an addition. I'm, I agree with everything that's been saying. I'm thinking about D&D specifically because that's the world that I kind of work in. Mm -hmm. And uh, it brings me to think about the, the half orc and how that's colored with racial foundations and how we're kind of working to undo all that. And I've been toying with that for a while, especially as a hat, like I relate to half elves a lot as a half black, half white man and all that and all the baggage that comes with that. And I personally think that if you're going to be working in a system that has been written in with racial undertones and that's pretty much anything that America has produced because we are based on a racial institution. And that's mm -hmm. another conversation, but we know that that happens. So I am currently trying to put my players in through situations that help them understand why this is written with a negative undertone. There will be, they will encounter half works that are being treated in a very stereotypical sense. And nine times out of 10, the players are like, what the F is up with that? And afterwards, there's always these interesting conversations and they'll be like, I love that you did that. And I was like, well, really that's just kind of the extreme of how they were originally supposed to be intended. Like you take a tiefling, for example, those are half demon people. So like, they're not gonna be allowed in any town potentially because of their race or their, and I know that's in a way skirting around because, and it's a discussion that's been floating around the TRPG community for a while. And I like the discussion, but I don't think we've gotten to the end of it. Mm -hmm. I think, yes, there's the option of being like, let's break that chain. Let's break that game and be far gone from it. But there's also, well, we're stuck with it. Let's make, let's show why it's wrong so that we can evolve past it. I don't really know how to succinctly say my opinion on that, but I think by leaning into the stereotypes in a safe environment with a discussion afterwards with people that you trust, don't do this in a public game. That's not a smart thing to do. There are ways of exploring the kind of effed up parts of how our fantasy is written. That is, that is honestly a great way to put it because it is important to think about, like, as you said, when it comes to TTRPG and D&D, &D, there's so many racial undertones that just because you're an orc, you're a savage, just because mm -hmm. you're a demon, you're demonic, just because you're a drow, you're evil. And it's like, well, what makes them evil? And if you ask them, well, they're dark elves. It's like, oh, just because, like, you don't want to say just because they're dark, but you're like, what mm -hmm. is made them evil? Well, they live in the underdark. So they live in the fantasy version of the ghetto. And you can mm -hmm. hear those undertones they're that are other, put in there. Other. And when you try to explain it to someone, they're like, well, that's not what I meant. It's not what you meant, but it's that's what's there. Mm -hmm. Well, it's almost as though uh, all of D&D &D was written either by Xanathar himself or like a Pelor follower. Like it's always like the perspective of the, the white man. But it, 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 I'm trying to explain that, like figure out why those stereotypes exist explore them as PCs or NPCs and you'll kind of begin to evolve and see like, oh yeah, this is, this is based on real life. This is a little messed up. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And that's the thing. Like, I think it's hard because as bad as some of those things are like, again, the orc savage thing, mm -hmm. you don't want to remove it because it helps people realize that that's where we were in society speaking, because people saw the orcs and was like, by default, it's a savage. And to get a little like harsh tone in it the orc has been compared to what they consider mandingos historically mm -hmm. or you know they the big buff burly dark-skinned individuals scary 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 you see them mm -hmm. run the other way unless we can uh -huh. make them ours to work for us to do our hard labor and we let them live in camp so they should be happy and you don't want to remove that because that's hiding the narrative but you also don't want people to feel comfortable with that right. still being the narrative put them in situations that hopefully make them wake up to why this is wrong as opposed to putting them in situations that help further maintain that stereotype again tricky stuff and you have to be really careful about how you do it and you have to talk to your players afterwards otherwise you're missing the point yes. and i love that and that's a strong solid point and i know gw it looked like you had a thought just sitting in the back of your mind ready no i was i was thinking everyone has said it perfectly uh to where you know keeping that conversation going with, with your players, with uh, creative people around you. 
um, you know, throwing ideas out to, you know, as Sydney said earlier, you know, I'm going to keep the ears of the half of the elves, but then we're going to change everything else, this and that, and just kind of make it your own, like, you know, just break the mold, break the pattern, and kind of make your own thing for, for you and, and your friends, and for people out there making, you know, their own games. Like, I have, um, uh, one of my friends is, you know, they're helping, they help make um, uh, the Motherlands, which is a beautiful, awesome game. Um, and just the, the way that they crafted their story and bringing different elements into it from, from uh, things that they, crea uh, they created themselves and they brought in from, you know, from the real world, from different cultures. It was beautiful to like, so th just keep that energy going and, and like, just don't, don't hold back. Just keep that change, that conversation going. And that, that is important and it's well put. And we're reaching close to our one hour length. So there's like just a few more points I wanna hit to make sure it's covered. Mm -hmm. And this one was uh, brought up by um, Utahime. So uh, excellent question as well. Has there been a memorable moment in your journey that has solidified why it is so important to have creators of color, like you wonderful people in the gaming slash nerd community? Perhaps a special moment with your fans, followers or anything like that. So again, is there any has there ever been a moment in your journey of becoming a creator within the community that why it's so important to have creators like us in the community that like really resonated with you? So when I first started streaming uh, with uh, Fable 42, Ukador back then before, uh, before uh, the, the, the change on the network, I, it was just like, oh, I'm gonna start this game. It's gonna be fun. Like all the other games I've played, we had like two sessions and it crashed. And that was like, <laughs> I, I learned, you know, the, 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 the hardcore thing of like, oh, teams actually don't always stay together. They burn and crash because things happen. People have jobs and, and, and what have you. Um, but when I started streaming here and I think I was telling some friends like, oh yeah, we're just gonna be playing some D&D &D and everything. It's gonna be pretty cool, pretty new. And they're like, oh, so you're gonna be the face of you know the people now. And I was like, wait, what? What do you what what do you mean? <laughs> like, oh, there's not too many, I don't see too many black people playing DD. &D. I don't see too many black people in that area. And I was just like, oh, oh God. Oh, oh, oh I'm I have a responsibility. People, oh, oh. <laughs> and, and I, I started to get really nervous, but after a while I started to think about it, and I was just like, no, like I want to be that person I wanted to see back when I was young. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want to be that for someone else who is trying to see themselves in this world and in, in, in these games and be like, hey, I, I can do that too. I had a player, I'm not going to say the name, but this player told me after one of our, our games that you were the reason, like what you did, this game and everyone in it was like the reason I got into gaming. I damn near cried after reading that message. Like, oh my God, thank I thank you. I don't. I didn't even really know how to respond. So it, just having, being able to have put something out there that you want others to see in, in themselves, that's what really pushes me. That's what want, makes me want to do what I do. It has to be hard I also want to like add on to that and on the opposite end because it's also super important for there to be creators because then they help new creators because I'm pretty young I'm like 22 I'm about to graduate college and usually I'm the baby of the group the youngest person so but like the creators who have been here a little bit longer than I have reaching out a helping hand whether that being cosplay or like Utihime and Alicia Marie love you both in the chat they've been so kind and just being like reaching out just being like hey you want to take a picture with me like yes I want to take a picture with you oh my god um all that kind of stuff so those moments of like someone already being in a spot that you want to be in and like holding that door open for you and holding out that hand and being like hey come in here too that's like that's that's really amazing and super important and that um and that's also happened in gaming too with like black girl gamers and groups like that so um as a black creator myself i really just want to grow myself and then continue that cycle so those mom moments like those i'm like yes i want to do this yes this is what keeps me going because 
I, people have done this for me and I want to do this for other people. Yes, that's a strong sentiment and one that I hope everyone can learn to resonate truly. Christoph, Sydney, either of you two? I think I'm still in, I'm having that moment now. I, I, I am constantly having to remind myself that black people are not a monolith. And it is unfortunate that I have been programmed to think that black people are a monolith. And so this realization, this epiphany that's been coming to me through the growth of Cantrip is that it's so important to have black creators because you need, to, we have to break that stereotype. We have to exist purely just being ourselves, living our own truth whatever black means to us. And slowly we can shed that monolith that has been so effectively spread over all of us. Because you mentioned Inuyasha, uh, someone mentioned Inuyasha a while ago. And I bet there are like four animes that are stereotyped as being blackly populated or black people like these animes. And it might be true, but again, why does that kind of stereotype exist? So I'm sitting here just trying to grow a business and realizing that like it there doesn't have to be that responsibility that you talked about GW it's not like there's this mantle of like well now as a black creator you better hands up and speak up for the people if that's what you want to do then go for that but if you just want to live your life you have just as much validity as a black creator as someone who's necessarily speaking out about it you know what I actually I appreciate that sentiment because a lot of I mean people- it's the perspective that comes from my specific background. And I think that's the importance of it. You just have to speak your truth as a black person. Well, no, I mean, I agree because if we come to the point where we do want to make sure that all black people are recognized, we also don't want to accidentally be clumped up that all black people are this. Mm-hmm. We want this for everyone, but we don't want everyone to be treated like, oh, we're all black. It's like, mm-hmm. we're all individuals. And I think that's part of the intention we said earlier that if you give someone a true personality in this creation, these characterizations, then at least if it's true to earth, then we feel recognized as individuals, not as a collective. And I think exactly. that's the big key. We want to be recognized as individuals who exist and deserve the respect, but not recognized as, oh, this group of Black people got what they want. That's not, I, Just I feel like everyone else in this world, they want to be recognized as individuals, and that's it. And yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's a strong one. And I, um, Sydney? Um, man, those are such good answers. <laughs> You're going to have the best one. We all know uh, it, Sydney. Come on now. No. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, there's just so much, right, like, that I have, like, swimming around in my head, like, because I think that you, you nailed something in terms of, like, some of the internal feelings I have, Christoph, like, feeling like you have, you are the one. It's just like, ooh, you know, like, GW, it's like, you are the, the, the black person on this you know, in this representing this all of us delegation right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and like, as much as it's like, no, that's not me. And no, I'm not going to do it. Yes, I'm doing it unconsciously. And yes, that is me. And I hate that. But that is because we're still so early in all of this, you know, like, I mean, in general, I think, you know, what streaming and the idea of Twitch, like, I don't know when Twitch was founded, but these are all things that are recent and we're it's, in it, it. yeah we're in it right now and there's so much uh weight to that that i feel like that doesn't necessarily get acknowledged that you know like behind all of this there's that weight and sometimes those moments are the things that help lift that weight so it's like you know what i could take on a little more weight you know those are the things that make you feel better Um, And for me, like, I have a very difficult time actually, like, acknowledging anything that I'm doing, because it's like, okay, I did it, good, moving on to the next thing, you know, or if it's just like, uh, you know, this was expected of me, if I need to do this, or if I need to get something done, I got to be the one doing it. So of course, you know, like, I just keep it moving. Um, So for me, it's had to be a, a combination of little moments that I think now I am starting to actually uh, let's soak in properly. You know, I, I think back to moments. So like the first moment was probably when I uh, volunteered for Black Girls Code. I was still in school and I was part of the New York, uh, the New York chapter. 
and I was teaching Lego robotics to this group of like teenagers because they were like you can relate to them don't be scared and I was like nah they're 16 I'm terrified I don't remember how to do this anymore (laughs) um but they were really really sweet and you know like they were so smart and they had those yeah they're like can we make the robot dance I'm like heck yeah you can make it dance and realizing that I had given them an experience that I myself had never had I've never had a black female teacher and I've have I have a graduate degree so that means throughout high school undergrad and grad school I have never had a black female teacher and I realized damn it made a difference that I was here you know um it it worked I was, you know, like I, they, they had like a group of interns, like walking in a herd, like we keep them in like a nice tight herd. So they never run away. Um, and they were just walking through the hallway and I saw like a little black kid and I was, and he looked at me and I looked at him and we gave each other the look and I was like, <laughs> heck yeah. Uh-huh. Like, <laughs> like that was look. another moment to be like, Ooh, it made a difference that he could see me be there, you know? And recently with this product that I just uh, worked on, you know, I have people coming out of the woodwork saying all types of things that are just beautiful. I'm just crying every night. Uh, But it feels good because it's the fuel I need to keep in this. Excellent. You're worried about not being able to follow up and that was a a strong follow up. I I talked too much. I I figured it out, I guess. (laughs) You know what? You you are great. Each I pressed A A B B before I started. <laughs> Doing Chico's that that explains that. So uh, we are going to close out. Just one last question for each of you before we um, close out this amazing panel. When it comes to Black creative and nerd culture, we're affected in many ways through wanting to add more representation or a stronger sense of representation. What do you believe? What kind of advice would you give to especially the younger creators, people who aren't aware of being a, how to make the change? What is the best thing that we can do as a community to help establish true inclusiveness, both for people to join and for people to feel represented? The advice I would give to anyone is to be like, just don't be afraid to speak up. Mm-hmm. Don't be afraid to make them aware um, and just keep persevering. Um, And I mean, as as you go, you know, you're going to, you know, get your friends, you're going to get a community, you're going to, you're going to build something as you keep taking these steps forward. That's what I would say. That's beautiful. And I see Christoph and Sydney both look like you're ready to say something. I think uh, constantly just give your reality double check, which is kind of woo woo, but it's important to just every now and then double check. Okay. Who did you recently hire? Why did you hire them? Who did you recently retweet? Why did you retweet that? Who did you recently uh, purchase from? Why did you purchase from them? It's a small thing, but it really does help. And uh, you'll find that you won't have to necessarily go out of your way to seek out black creators or black productions, which right now that's the trend. It's like, all right, we got to find someone to include in our next campaign. But instead just begin to realize, huh, here is a lot of the same that I've been experiencing. Here's the life that I've been living up till this point. How do I double check my reality and make sure that it's truly an open reality? One that someone could walk in and I would meet them as an equal, as opposed to, all of your walls go up right away. So I get that's a fancy way of saying check your racism, but we'll, st- we'll stick with double check your reality for now because that's more palatable. <laughs> that's the sugar <laughs> phrase. That's the sugar phrase. Um, I'll jump in quick. Uh, mine is pretty simple. It's just uh, when you are ready to make that leap, whether or not it's in streaming, whether or not it's in games, whether or not you have a business venture or you just want to throw something or a charity or a fundraiser, Just do it because if you wait for yourself to feel ready, you're not going to do it. You're you're never going to feel ready. I submit work that I know is done, that I've triple, quadruple checked, and it doesn't feel, and I'm like, it's not ready, but it has to go because at a certain point, you will stand in your own way. And I feel like we stand in our ways on so many different intersectional areas, you know, like how much money you have in your bank account, where you grew up whether or not this thing looks like it's for you, or if you see people doing it already, the hatred, the negativity that could come from people just, you know, 
walking down the street and deciding, you know, I'm just going to send a bad message to ruin her day or their day or whatever it is. You know, you have to be prepared for that. But at the end of the day, just do it before you can talk yourself out of it. And you'll realize that all the fears that you had about people saying what and that and the other or the difficulty of the journey do, does not compare to achieving what you were meant to do. That's strong advice. Jade? Well, mine are definitely going to sound like, you know, a little after school special messages. But I have three. One, trust your gut. If something doesn't feel right, don't do it. Just, just don't do it. Whoa. Like, yeah, like just don't, especially in a creative situation where you putting your name on something, just if it doesn't feel right, don't do it. Two, um, just do, which also goes with that is to stay true to yourself just because something's popular doesn't mean that you have to do it or just because like in my case it's a black streamer just because like black female streamers stream sims doesn't mean that I personally have to stream sims like just do what you want to do and then lastly just find a group of people that will support you and doing what you want to do and trusting your gut because that makes everything a little bit easier for you that oh this is honestly, again, some great advice in general. And this is not just for black creators. This is for creators of all kind. Just, you know, speak up, be aware, check your reality. Focus double on check your reality, more. double, double check, check it, double check your reality. These are all important things to just know as is just in general, as a creator or even a fan, just be aware of these simple things. And I think I, the only advice that was kind of given to me a long time ago in the same way was, if you're uncomfortable, speak up so that you can be comfortable. And if they don't want to make you comfortable, go somewhere that will. Mm -hmm. If the group of people, as it's it's putting everything you guys have all said, and you all feel the same way that I've been told, is sometimes the place just doesn't work. The group of, the group of people just don't work. Or there just isn't enough awareness, and they're not willing to make that change. And if they're not willing to listen, go somewhere that they will listen. And then gather that force and that power to move to the next step. Life is a series of steps and we want to eventually make it to the next flight, but all we can do is worry about that next step. And sometimes the next step is just simply speaking up, making people aware, making that change. And if that still doesn't work, be the change. Beautiful. Yes. 100%. Strong. So um, that will, that will be, we'll be wrapping up this panel. So I want to go around everyone, um, reintroduce yourself for the conclusion, plug your social media, Again, whatever projects you're doing and um, everyone who's watching, please, when you hear, you see their little at, go over there, follow. This is part of that awareness. One of the biggest things awareness is when you see change, follow it. And the members here in this panel are members of that change. They are color of change right here. Follow, see what they do. And I promise you, they share, they, share, they retweet what other people are doing. And this is how we make change by following those that are doing change so we can be the domino to the future. So GW, start it off. Sure, uh, I'm GW, you can find me here on February 42. You can also find me on IG and Twitter at uh, GW005, that's two Bs and two zeros. And uh, I just wanna thank everyone for being here, all the viewers, uh, all the panelists. Uh, please, if you uh, cannot give, please share the uh, link to the Co-Fi for Color of Change. Uh, the Senate around just to uh, help us build something great. And we really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Sydney. Uh, yeah. So once again, I'm Sydney Adams. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at, at Rainy underscore Fro, R-A-I-N-I. -I. I also think it is floating below me. Um, probably better to do on Twitter. I only do Twitch stuff for charity. Uh, but um, yeah. I just finished with a Black History Month product on Magic, The Gathering. It's called Black is Magic. If you follow me on Twitter, you'll be able to see all the links. It's really awesome. And that is also for a good cause, Black Girls Code. So if you can donate to, you know, Color of Change, and if you have a little extra to get this awesome product and give to some girls so Black girls can learn how to code, uh, that would be awesome. And uh, yeah, I'll end with a quick little bit of advice. Find your tribe. Find mm. people who will uplift you and find people who encourage you. That's it. Beautiful. And Christoph. 
Uh, my name is Christoph Fischer. I am the owner of Cantrip Candles, which is a candle company that makes tabletop themed fragrances. Uh, you can find us at www.cantripcandles.com or at Cantrip Candles. And we are having a pre-order on Monday the 22nd, pretty much all day Pacific Standard Time. So that's a really good opportunity to get an order because they sell out quick. You heard, head over to Cantrip Candles. I'm just saying, go over there, do it, get, get okay. them stuff. I see okay. GW over there writing things down. Uh, you said the Monday February the 22nd. 22nd. It's Monday a big day. day. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. <laughs> I'm just saying, if you, to support, you want to support Black culture, you support Black businesses, and Cantrip Candles is here, part of Black culture and nerd culture. So, um, you know, take a chance to check it out, please. And Jade? Uh, um, I am Jade Valkyrie. I put in the chat my Twitch which is Jade Valkyrie with a three, not an E, but everywhere else I'm Jade Valkyrie with an E. So, um, yep, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram. Those are my two favorites along with Twitch. Um, and my parting advice would be the best thing to support creators who aren't running, you know, businesses like Christoph and Cantrip Candles for the rest of us is to engage with our content, retweet, like it, save it, comment on it, send it to your friends, send links, clip it, all that stuff because that really helps us creators and mm -hmm. that also will help be able to 42 and the charities so please do that <laughs> thank you and i have been the uh moderator for this jordan better known as casual campbell you can follow me at casual underscore campbell on all social medias my final words for this is you have heard from some amazing members of the community who have all done something to help establish black creativity black culture nerd culture and i promise you the world at large all we can do is take our next step. So all I ask is that you do the same, whether it be donating to Color of Change, liking that one extra post of someone who's working hard to show off their music, their writing, their creation, retweeting, commenting, show your friend off your phone, hold it in front of them and say, check this out. There is no such thing as little effort. There's only such thing as no effort. If you're just trying, you're already making a change and together, we can be the color of change. It's not just one color, it's a rainbow. So let's do our best to stay together and strong for whatever we aim to do. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, stay connected more for next week for GW. We'll be closing out this Black History Month special with his the color of change one shot. I'm telling you, GW is an amazing DM who has yet to be my DM, but it's okay. I'm not salty. Right now. <laughs> it's it coming, is, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> And I want to thank, I know we just got another donation. So I want to thank whoever provided that donation. Every bit counts. Yes, thank you. Because I promise you, you see us, if you keep donating to causes like this, in another 10 years, there'll be another panel of new creators. Mm -hmm. We're grateful that you gave them the opportunity to be this. Hashtag Fabled for Change. Thank you.